<laughs> Our speaker for the day is Adam Greer. He got his PhD at the University of Miami in marine biology and fisheries in 2013. Um, moved up north to uh, University of Georgia, um, where he was postdoc for a couple of years, and then took a westward shift to USM, where he is now assistant research professor. And his title is up there, so I won't read it. OK. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here today. So um, yeah, today I'm going to be talking mostly about uh, a Gulf of Mexico research project that I've been a part of for the past three years, essentially. Um, and what you're seeing here is a photo that uh, Brian Zwankowski, one of our uh, collaborators or co-PIs on the project took. And it's a plume front at near the mouth of Mobile Bay. And it's a really, um, you know, kind of an interesting uh, expression of how physical oceanography can really impact uh, the biology. You see uh, sea foam, which is a, a product of diatoms. We know that zooplankton and fish all kind of aggregate in these features. Um, but there may be similar processes occurring below the surface that we're not aware of. Um, and a lot of these uh, high resolution uh, sampling systems are allowing us to finally kind of describe uh, the patterns of different organisms uh, in these features. And so we're we'll talking a lot about plankton today. And so just plankton 101, what is plankton? Uh, it comes from this uh, Greek word planktos, uh, meaning wanderer or drifter, which kind of gives you an idea of how these organisms live. Uh, by definition, they can't swim against the prevailing oceanographic currents. Um, three main groups are phytoplankton, which are responsible for about half of the oxygen production in our atmosphere, the zooplankton, or the animal component, and marine snow, which is this kind of catch-all category of uh, detrital material that's sinking through the water column, a very important part of the biological pump. And so I'm showing you images that were all from uh, just offshore here in the northern Gulf of Mexico. Um, phytoplankton, uh, this is an example of an aggregate of diatoms. Uh, these long chains. Um, the zooplankton are divided into two main groups. Uh, you have holoplankton, which spend their entire lives as plankton, and the meroplankton, which make up the early life stages of most bony fishes and then a bunch of different um, invertebrates as well. So uh, here we have a flatfish larva, this is a pipefish, a lobster phylosoma, different crab larval stages, and a tube anemone larva. The holoplankton are uh, divided up into uh, the phytoplankton grazers, which include copepods, appendicularians, and salps and doliolids. And then also a bunch of uh, holoplankton consume other zooplankton, like most of your gelatinous organisms, siphonophores, uh, uh, tenophores, uh, hydromedusae, as well as uh, ketid gnats and polychaete worms. The marine snow uh, makes up, of course, this catch-all category of detrital material. Um, it also includes discarded exoskeletons and can serve as a, a, a way that uh, material can be recycled within the water column. So that's a shrimp attached to one marine snow aggregate. And so if you look at the entire biological pump, uh, plankton are involved in almost every facet of this entire system. And it's, it essentially results in the ocean being this net carbon sink. And I'm not going to talk about the entire biological pump today. Just focusing on a few specific things. Um, first of all, how we sample and understand the biological pump uh, has led to some biases that I think uh, we're starting to address with some high resolution sampling. And then I'm gonna get into some uh, mechanisms that we can have uh, you know, mixed distributions that can aggregate um, and really look at thin layers as kind of a case study of how this can happen. And then I'm going to get into some of the details of the interactions among zooplankton. And this is kind of where there's a lot of exciting new questions that we're just starting to address uh, with some high-resolution sampling systems. And at the end, I'll bring it all together and explain how it's kind of fitting into this trait-based approach to understanding plankton ecology, and then finish with some methodological challenges that I think we still need to address. And so we think about uh, patterns of plankton and time and space. We have to consider any pattern as a product of physical structure that's introduced by the environment and then the biological structure introduced by uh, the life history of the organisms and the interactions among them. And that goes into driving the true pattern. So consider anything inside this circle as a pattern that could be detected on any spatiotemporal scale. 
So on the physical side, you have gradients and a bunch of different oceanographic properties. There are also features like we saw in the opening slide, fronts, eddies, um, layering as inter internal waves as well. Biological side, there's uh, gradients in feeding, predation, and reproduction, and then there's competition as well as social interactions. But we can't really see what's happening in the real world. We have to use some kind of sampling filter, some uh, instrument that we then use to give us data that then we try to say something about what's happening in the real world. And for a long time, that's been uh, these net-based systems. Uh, this is a bongo net shown here. It's towed vertically through the water column. It gives you a sample. Uh, you don't really know where that sample came from, but you generally have an idea. You know that it was somewhere along that uh, tow path. And if you have any kind of gelatinous or fragile organisms, they're not really well sampled by the net system. And the minimum vertical scale you can resolve isn't necessarily 20 meters, but it's on that order. You can obviously get lower with some of these multiple opening and closing net systems. But there is uh, still a minimum scale that uh, is on the order of about 5 to 10. So we can be jealous of the terrestrial ecologists for a second because they've been able to describe the structure and the environment for a long time because it's such an accessible system to us. Uh, this is a classic figure from, you might recognize it from an ecology uh, textbook from when you were young. And uh, it's from this paper of 1958 where uh, MacArthur and probably some dedicated uh, field assistants went out and observed these different warbler species all uh, aggregating in different parts of the tree. And so um, some of these initial descriptions have really drove some of the thinking in ecology about how you know, biological diversity can persist if you minimize competition among species. And so when all these similar species uh, aggregate in different areas, it reduces competition and allows that diversity to persist. Do we have similar data for ocean ecology? I'd argue we don't. Um, if you were just to imagine sampling this tree with a bongo net, you'd get a certain proportion of different species, and it, all the structure that's ecologically relevant would be wiped out, and you just wouldn't know. And so people have realized some of the shortcomings of these net-based systems for a really long time. And in the 1990s, with the advent of uh, digital cameras and then increased computing power, these uh, imaging systems started to become really prolific. There were a bunch of different ones that were made. Um, but I like to divide them up by the sampling volume because that really determines which organisms they most quantitatively <coughs> sample. Um, and so if you think about uh, the relatively small volume sampling systems, uh, the video plankton recorder is probably one of the most widely used one that was developed at Woods Hole. Um, and Zoovis, which also um, is one of these small volume ones, these are great for copepods, very abundant plankton. Um, they can quantify them quite well. As you go up into uh, intermediate sampling volumes, these can get relatively small gelatinous organisms, some things that are a little bit rarer. Uh, this includes the sipper as well as the underwater vision profiler. And then there are also some uh, large sampling volume systems, the LAPIS, which is specifically designed to look at large Skypo medusae, so large gelatinous organisms, has a, a very coarse pixel resolution, but a really large sampling volume. And then the system that I've been working with for almost 10 years now, um, is the in situ ichthyoplankton imaging system, also known as the ISIS. And the way it works, um, this is just an image of the system itself. On these bottom two pods, these are the imaging pods, and so this is an overhead view of those bottom two pods. Uh, you have an LED that passes through a pinhole, hits a plano convex lens, a mirror, and goes across an image water parcel and then back into a camera. And so anything in this image water parcel blocks the light source and is picked up as a shadow by the camera. And so we call this uh, shadow graph imagery. And the reason it is uh, an effective way to, to do this kind of imagery is um, it gives you a large depth of field. So anything in that imaged water parcel uh, will remain in focus. And so you don't have problems with uh, things being blurry if they're different distances from the camera. So we combine that with um, two, we have the two camera set, uh, setups on this new version of the ISIS. Um, and then we tow it at a relatively fast speed, about five knots. Um, and then we can quantify a pretty large size range of different organisms. Um, along with that, we have a bunch of oceanographic instruments that are collecting all the physical data. Um, and then these uh, wings on the side of the vehicle, um, we can control those and allows it to uh, dive up and down through the water column on a set, um, uh, dis or set distance back from the uh, ship. And so when people have towed these uh, high-resolution imaging systems, there's been quite a lot of new discoveries that 
have been pretty pretty substantial in um, improving our understanding of the uh, open ocean especially. And so uh, this paper was a Nature recently uh, global survey using the underwater vision profiler. And they discovered that these large protists called rhizaria uh, makes up about 5.2% of the uh, biotic, biota carbon reservoir, which equals the entire biomass of mesozooplankton in the open ocean. So really just a, a completely neglected portion of the open ocean um, based on how people have been sampling it up until then. Um, about 10 years earlier, they did a uh, trans uh, Atlantic transect using the video plankton recorder. This is a group from Woods Hole. And they found patches of this nitrogen-fixing cyanobacteria called trichodesmium, and uh, found that it was associated with anticyclonic eddies but also just the fact that they're doing this entire transect, we know that, um, well, most of us do oceanography where we have stations, and they were finding these really small patches of, of, of aggregations of trichodesmia much, much higher than, than the average. And so using that information, they were able to calculate that nitrogen fixation might be uh, grossly underestimated with uh, previous information. And so uh, that's really an important part of this is that with these systems, you can you can get an idea of how much variability there would be between stations uh, in a typical survey. Um, and so when you look at imaging data, we can also look at multiple trophic levels simultaneously. And especially in the vicinity of uh, coastal oceanographic features like fronts, you can have an overlap of multiple groups um, uh, in one area, which can lead to really high rates of predation or um, trophic transfer. And this is part of the work I did when I was uh, at UGA, was digging the literature and saying, asking the question, what do we see when we look at all these high resolution measurements? And uh, uh, we calculated this uh, spatial overlap metric. Um, and for all these different measurements of different interactions among different trophic levels, this is a histogram. And what it's showing you is that uh, around zero is essentially random. Uh, there's not much overlap but it's a skewed normal distribution. So if you look at all these different um, uh, measurements, there's often quite a bit of spatial overlap. And uh, this is the uh, percent increase, or the, yeah, it's the amount of increase uh, productivity of the higher trophic level you'd expect to be uh, when it's due to spatial overlap alone. So um, essentially anything at over above one, uh, there's such high overlap that, um, uh, that you can expect the higher trophic level to be accessing uh, much higher concentrations of its prey and therefore feeding at a faster rate. And this is a multiplicative effect. So if you have multiple trophic levels overlapping, you can expect really high productivity of a higher trophic level. And so uh, when we divided up all this, this literature view into different systems, uh, we found that uh, temperate and tropical coastal environments had a really high uh, potential and importance of spatial overlap for explaining uh, higher trophic level of production. And so um, some of this uh, fine scale overlap can be pretty important in certain systems for uh, productivity, but there's a lot of weaknesses with this approach. Obviously it's, it's a literature review. You have to make a bunch of assumptions. Uh, one is that there's a type one functional response. So if you have more prey in a given area, uh, then the predator will respond by eating essentially more at, on a linear relationship. Um, and we also have to greatly simplify the trophic uh, food web. This can be seven uh, trophic levels or more. Uh, we only have three just because of the fact that these, um, we're not sampling the entire uh, ecosystem. We're only sampling certain chunks. And usually a given study will only cover, say, chlorophyll A and some kind of zooplankton grazer. And then another study will look at just zooplankton and fish. And there's very rarely an entire um, you know, trophic food web that's sampled. And there's also a lot of complexity in some of these lower trophic levels where they will photosynthesize sometimes and then also be heterotrophic at other times. And so this is a kind of an ongoing area of research with a lot of uh, plankton uh, researchers where um, looking at how and why certain uh, behaviors exist um, in different areas. So, now that we've seen that, you know, that the spatial overlap is pretty important, what are some mechanisms that can cause overlap in, especially in the Gulf of Mexico? And for that, I'm going to look uh, at uh, thin layers, which are really understudied in the Gulf of Mexico. 
but um, we were fortunate enough to sample one uh, during some of these uh, Concord um, sampling. So um, most of my work has been involved with this Concord Consortium. Uh, this is our general sampling area, which was on the uh, northern Gulf of Mexico shelf. Uh, we did uh, multiple transects with the ISIS that you can see in the purple color. We also had uh, net toes at the beginning and end of each ISIS transect, as well as moored instruments offshore and near Mobile Bay, measuring currents and things like that. So you can see the average current uh, speed and direction uh, during, this is the springtime. And this is a satellite image showing optical backscatter. And just what you notice is that this area is really heavily influenced by river runoff. There's a lot of productivity on the shelf. And uh, the philosophy or the reason behind Concord in the first place was that when Deepwater Horizon happened, um, oil ended up mostly in this area generally, but it was very hard to predict where it was going to go. And this area here uh, has a lot of variability with winds, with river plumes, and so it was very un much an unknown thing of all the different oceanographic properties in this area and how it was going to influence the trajectory of oil. And also the biology is really concentrated in this area as well. So it's a pretty important area, uh, not only for oil spill movements, but then the interactions with the different groups of, of animals and plants. And so this is the uh, middle sampling corridor. So if we go back here. So this is along this corridor here. Um, for three different seasons, uh, you have distance on the x-axis and depth on the y-axis. This is interpolated uh, salinity as well as bottle samples of particulate organic nitrogen. And so you can see the size of the dot corresponds to more uh, particulate organic nitrogen. And then this is the uh, current direction at one of those moorings. Um, if you look at this side, this is showing the particle concentration as indicated by the uh, ISIS. So we just uh, looked at how many particles were imaged and their distribution. And so they really nicely follow the uh, isohalines, which are shown in black. Um, and fall relatively well mixed water column, not a whole lot of particles, or uh, these are mostly marine snow aggregates. And then there's a lot in spring, and, and then in summer, the particles get kind of aggregated in this relatively narrow part of the water column. And so this is set up really nicely for um, the production of uh, thin layer, because usually thin layers need, thin layers these dense aggregations of plankton that only span about three, millimeter, three meters vertically. Um, and they require a lot of stratification usually. And we were able to sample one of these features on the western corridor at this offshore area. And so I'm going to show you a video of just one pass through one of these layers. Uh, this is the chlorophyll A fluorescence from the ISIS, and this is salinity um, and temperature. And this is all these are with depth. And the green dot is going to show you where the actual image is coming from as the video is playing. So I start the video. You'll see a lot of these kind of hair-like things. These are all uh, diatoms. And then once we get inside the layer, you'll see that these diatoms start to become really, really abundant. The barrel-like organisms are doliolids. These are phytoplankton grazers. And then as we get slightly above the uh, layer, you'll start to see a lot of these puffy things, which are uh, marine snow aggregates uh, just above the layer. And then we still see a lot of zooplankton as we get out of the layer. A lot of these dots are copepods. Um, and so you can just see in this very narrow range how dramatically the environment is changing for a lot of these groups. Um, and so we wanted to really look at when there is this dynamic feature, how do all the different zooplankton groups respond to this? And so to process the data, you can imagine the, uh, quite a bit of work just looking at that one video. Uh, we looked at both cameras, so the small camera, we automatically segment particles, so we take an image like this, we threshold it, we convert it to black and white, and so any uh, black particles that are above a certain size, uh, pixel size range will be cut out, and then we uh, identify them using keyboard shortcuts uh, that are customized um, in image J. And so you can actually do about 2,000 IDs um, every hour, which is, it, it, it's a lot of work, but it does give you really high quality data. Um, and I'll get into some more about the methodology later, and kind of, that's kind of one of my uh, future directions. Um, but then we subsampled for some of these smaller and more abundant groups where we looked at just individual profiles through the layer. Uh, 
For a large camera, we manually uh, segment and ID these rare organisms. So these are uh, fish larvae, hydronuce, tenophores, and we identify the fish larvae uh, to as low a level as possible. Not always to family level, but as close as we can get. So we look at the physical conditions. This is again at the southern end of this western corridor. Uh, so higher distances along all these axes are further towards the south. And then, of course, depth is on the y-axis. Uh, you can see temperature, salinity, and then also sigma t, or density. And remember in the uh, video, we had this kind of temperature inversion. I don't know if you guys noticed that, but there was a, a temperature inversion near that thin layer forming. And you can see it quite well in the interpolated temperature data where you have uh, <laughs> warm water being pushed downward and then some cooler water coming up. And if we look at the, where the thin layer is relative to this, so this is the exact same, uh, same uh, cross-section through the water column. Uh, this is a chlorophyll A fluorescence. You can see the thin layer quite well. Uh, these black lines are where we sampled with uh, the subsampling. So these are the, just crosses <laughs> through the uh, layer. And the layer also shows up quite well in the dissolved oxygen. So you can see really high dissolved oxygen inside the layer. There's a little area just under the layer where there's probably no light at all. And uh, uh, actually a little bit of a low oxygen area there. Um, but if, uh, if we pass, if we look at each individual profile going through, these are the black lines. So this is four, six, you know, all these are, are the ones we looked at for cobopods. Um, you can see kind of the layer rising through the water column as we get further towards the south. And so here is the cobopod data. Um, the, the depth is on the y-axis, concentration on the x-axis. The color corresponds to chlorophyll A fluorescence. And so what we were expecting to see was when there's a peak in chlorophyll, we would see a peak in cob cobopod abundance. But it's not really what happens. Actually, when we get further south, we start to see more of the cobopods, which se seems to suggest that they're aggregating near that, uh, that temperature inversion or whatever is happening near the surface um, just south of the layer. And this is an image from inside this peak right here. And so you can see uh, just all these little dots are uh, cobopods. If you zoom in, it's not apparent right now, but um, they are cobopods, just to take my word for it. And uh, they reach concentration of about 400,000 per meter cubed in these, in these small scale areas. And so one of the great things about working on Concord, it's an interdisciplinary group, and so we have access to some of these high-resolution physical models uh, that give us kind of this broader spatial context to some of our measurements. And so this is showing uh, surface divergence as run for the model in our uh, sampling domain. And so uh, the red colors are divergent currents, the blue colors are convergent currents. And so you see this is our sampling area where we found the layer and this convergent feature, you can see this blue streak uh, crossing the sampling area right when we saw that layer. Um, which suggests, and there's also just generally a lot of convergent and divergent activity in this western area during the summer at least. Um, and so if we look at the images and what the images told us uh, just across the entire transect, these are the doliolids which you saw in that video, uh, just uh, really high numbers of those reaching about 30,000 per uh, cubic meter. And they really, this is plotted along um, overlaying oxygen. So the larger the dot, the higher the abundances are. And so you can see that uh, doliolids tend to follow the trajectory of that layer quite well and then reach kind of peak biomasses just south of the layer where we saw uh, those copepods also aggregating. If we look at marine snow aggregates this time on top of chlorophyll A, uh, they also tend to kind of follow the trajectory of the layer and then reach a peak in this area, but there's also another uh, peak just north of the layer. And they don't reach quite as high abundances. So these are uh, aggregates that are above about uh, 1.4 millimeters uh, equivalent spherical diameter. So they're relatively large aggregates uh, that we're measuring, and we're missing all the things that are smaller. Uh, the zooplankton kind of form these two distinct groups where um, this is uh, ketonath. They tend to aggregate near the surface, but they're also pretty well dispersed throughout the water column, but definitely reach a peak south of the layer. And then if we look at a different community, only slightly vertically offset. So there's very few of them near the surface, but they're pretty abundant in the midwater column. Uh, but they reach a peak just north of the layer and a slightly deeper depth. So just just you can see how only a slight vertical offset can lead to these really different distributions when you have a dynamic feature uh, like a thin layer. And there's just not that many of them um, in that area where we see a lot of other groups. Yeah. 
If we look at the larval fish, so we, this is to family level or as close as we could get, so some of them we don't, can't ID really well. It's definitely dominated by these engrolids, which have a really interesting kind of surface-oriented distribution, much like the teeth gnats, and they tend to be really abundant just south of the layer as well. Um, and then in this area, generally, there's just a lot of different groups that are pretty well represented. So there's just a, a bunch of different uh, laurel fish types that are aggregating this area. Um, and so we're, this is still a work in progress. We're still working on kind of teasing apart some of the mechanisms that might be driving this layer. But we can just see that there's a lot of vertical heterogeneity just with the layer itself, but there's a lot of horizontal uh, changes as well. And so this is kind of a unique thing because there's not often where people can sample through an entire layer and see the differences on both sides. Um, and then we see just, yeah, there's a lot of horizontal uh, patchiness as well. So we can obviously, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, when there are features like this, it'll generate much, much higher encounter rates for uh, not only larval fish, but a bunch of different other zooplankton uh, than if you were to take an average. But we're still just looking at spatial overlap. And so if what's really important, especially we consider uh, the functioning of these systems is the outcomes of these interactions. What happens when you have a bunch of different groups all together in the same area? Who are the winners? Who are the losers? That's just uh, going to really determine, um, be really important for understanding how these systems function. So uh, now that we've kind of gone over some mechanisms of aggregation, I'm going to talk a bit more about some of the details of interactions, uh, specifically focusing on the larval fish and some of the other groups. Um, that they encounter uh, in the meso to macro zooplankton size range. Um, and this is where there's a lot of kind of exciting new questions that are coming up from some of these imaging systems or the data produced by these imaging systems. And so when you think about larval fish, many of you are probably really familiar with them. Um, the egg and early life stages of the larvae, there's extremely high mortality, up to 99% or more. Um, but there's also quite a bit of uh, morphological diversity. And when you think about it, for the life cycle of fish, these, these larvae are really <coughs> important for uh, population sustainability. So some of them have to survive. And so it makes sense that they would have some traits that would maximize their survival probability, given what they can control in their immediate environment. <coughs> and so when you think about larval traits, they can't really do much about the environment that, they can't do much about starvation, I should say because they're spawned in a certain area. They have, there's fine scale uh, physics as well as biology that determines the feeding environment that they're in. Uh, there's really nothing that the traits can do to help them in that area other than just simple uh, certain visual perception, which um, all larvae are pretty much vis visual feeders. Uh, but there is seemingly something they could do about predation or re reducing predation in some way. And generally, it's thought that if larvae just grow faster, that they'll spend less time in the vulnerable stages and therefore um, reduce predation uh, rates. But in the short term, when there's a predator-prey encounter, larvae encounters, encounters a predator, short-term options are basically to hide, flee, or defend. And there are many larvae that have me obvious mechanical defenses. They have large spines uh, that are clearly uh, designed to, uh, or selected to, um, provide some mechanical defense. There's a lot of plankton that use chemical defenses. There's no evidence that I'm aware of that larvae use that, but uh, you can think of toxic, uh, harmful algal blooms where there's clearly selection for chemical defenses against grazing. And so, um, kind of a, well, this is a, a quote. When you think about larvae and how they live, they have relatively simple ecological tasks, but they have this tremendous diversity of morphologies that are seemingly not that closely related to the adult forms. And so I'm reminded of this quote that you may have seen before, but nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. But I argue that we have to kind of consider the ecology of these, these organisms and really consider their evolutionary history as well and how they're, they, they're products of millions of years of evolution and each life stage is optimized for survival in that stage. So you know that adults are clearly adapted to their environment what about larvae? How, are they, how do they have certain adaptations that might maximize survival? And this is appropriate that it's uh, Charles Darwin Day two days ago, um, but um, it, it's something to think about as I show these next few slides that uh, it'll profit the individual not to have its nutriment wasted upon building up a useless structure. And so when you look at a lot of these larvae, this is a larval oarfish. It has a long 
uh, dorsal fin ray with these regular pigmented swellings. And the adult does not have very much uh, uh, similarity to it. But when you think about these two quotes, does this really make sense to have these, these uh, large structures that uh, it's very not very obvious what, what purpose they're serving? Uh, this is a flatfish larva. It also has a large dorsal fin, uh, or dorsal fin ray that has these uh, pigments and also these fleshy extensions. Uh, the adult, of course, does not have it. These are all larval uh, mectophids of various forms, and the adults have kind of this generic look to them. There's not a whole lot of similarity to the larvae at all, uh, but you can see just these dramatic um, morphologies where you have eyes on stalks. This is a trailing gut that's pigmented. This one also has a trailing gut, but it's clearly flattened out, very similar to a lot of flatfish larvae. Um, and these are all within the same family. So um, it's pretty pretty remarkable. And I think it's kind of an underappreciated evolutionary phenomenon, all these different larval forms uh, that, these, that these fish have. And so when you think about our short-term options again, uh, they're to hide, flee, or defend. Well, these traits aren't helping them hide. In many cases, they're making them more conspicuous. Uh, they're not helping them flee because they're increasing drag by having these long appendages. It would actually decrease their uh, escape response sw swimming speed. And then many of them aren't really, they're really soft features, so they get broken off in the nets. They're not spiny. And they're not really helping them in any defense in any way. And so with the working with the imaging data, and I'll show you in this in a bit, uh, we came up with this idea that they may be mimicking uh, a bunch of other gelatinous zooplankton that are about the same size as them. And so uh, many of you are probably familiar with Batesian mimicry, which was uh, discovered or first described by this gentleman here studying, um, uh, he was studying butterflies. Um, and the, basically the way it works is that um, you have something that's seemingly, uh, sorry, that's, that's actually venomous, uh, that's mimicked by something that uh, it receives protection by, by, by uh, looking like something that's noxious. And so uh, the scarlet king snake, coral snake, is one classic example um, where the scarlet king snake is essentially a sheep in wolf's clothing. It receives protection by resembling something that is either noxious or unpalatable to a predator. And so it's a lot about, a lot of it's about uh, predator perception. The mim these do not look exactly alike. We can tell that very well but uh, it's about what the predator can perceive. And apparently, and natural selection has shown that this looks good enough to receive some kind of protection. And so Batesian mimicry is one of these phenomena that's still cited to this day as kind of one of the most compelling examples of natural selection in action. In the marine world, there aren't really that many examples, although there are a few on coral reefs where the water is very clear you can see there's certain flatworms that resemble, or the fish that resemble flatworms, and they receive presumably some kind of protection. There's mimics of, of moray eels as well. Um, but we think there might be, uh, at least in the plankton, there seems to be a lot of characteristics that closely align with a lot of characteristics of Batesian mimicry complexes on land, which I'll get to in a minute. But uh, there's a lot of these gelatinous organisms that are not necessarily noxious, but they are really low in carbon, and so uh, they would not be as palatable to predators as a fish larva. And so that's what I'm showing here. Is uh, this is a feeding uh, study that was done quite a while ago, but they fed this blue-headed wrasse a bunch of different uh, prey types that are a bunch of different gelatinous organisms, and so these are B and T is bell and tentacles. Um, and uh, what you can see is that compared to a controlled food, a lot of these gelatinous organisms are not, uh, not consumed at very high rates. And so the ones that are have uh, anomalously high carbon content relative to other gelatinous organisms. And so, uh, um, and especially they did some other tests where they removed some of the stingers and um, fed them. But anyway, the, the, the ones that are eaten tend to have a bit higher carbon content. Another thing that all most Batesian mimicry complexes uh, have is an abundant and relatively undesirable model organism that the, the mimickers uh, resemble. And in a lot of these coastal systems, the gelatinous organisms are much more common than fish larvae. And this may seem like very basic information, but you have to remember that until recently, we haven't had the data to even say how abundant fish larvae are relative to gelatinous organisms that are about the same size. 
And so, um, yeah, in almost all coastal systems, some kind of gelatinous organism is much more abundant. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of just really strong resemblances where this is a, uh, this is a, a tenophore called a cested tenophore. It's very flat, transparent. And uh, leptocephalus larvae, which are very common, have a pretty, pretty good resemblance where sometimes you can't really tell them apart unless you look closely. Um, these are all siphonophores. This is two siphonophores and a tenophore. And what you'll notice is that with the siphosome, which is this part of the siphonophore, there are these regular pigmented swellings all along that um, siphosome that's very common for all siphonophores. And it happens a lot in uh, tenophores as well, where you have these regular either extensions or just pig or, uh, <coughs> bundles of essentially more dense material. And this is a grouper larva. It has this long appendage that has the same kind of pigmented swellings. The uh, pelvic fins on this flat fish also have pigment and swellings. Same with the dorsal fins. And this is a goosefish larva um, that has these kind of long extensions, you can see. Um, there's a lot of uh, kind of also resemblances of flatfish to salps. And with the imaging, we, we see a lot of unique behaviors as well. So these flatfish, a lot of them tend to be curled up in the images, and then their dorsal fin rays are sticking out. And they have this kind of superficial resemblance to this goblet medusa, which is really, really common in the northern gulf. Um, and uh, may, they might be using some behavior to resemble something uh, less palatable. Another aspect of their behavior that we can quantify in the images is the angle of orientation. So this is a fish, that's a fish, and this is a ketonath. They have a somewhat of a resemblance, but you can tell them apart pretty easily. Um, this is showing the absolute value of orientation, minus 90. So anything that's close to 90 is orienting straight up and down. Anything that's close to zero is horizontal. And this is the aspect ratio that when we fit an ellipse to that organism. So we take all the fish larvae we have, fit an ellipse, measure how, how long it is versus how wide it is. And what you'll notice, or the pattern that emerges, is that as, as fish larvae become more and more elongated, they tend to orient vertically. And so this is a significant uh, relationship. And ketonaths, of course, also tend to orient vertically. And so there's a lot of overlap amongst these elongated larvae with ketonaths. And so you can imagine that this could provide some protection, or it could just be a convergent uh, hunting strategy. It's really hard to know for sure. But um, there, there is this kind of behavioral resemblance among these groups. So it's clearly a, a working hypothesis. It's, it's a new idea that we're trying to still work out. I think there's a lot of uh, future work that has to be done. Um, and we don't really know the consequences of a population based on some of these interactions. Uh, but there's a, the real unknown part uh, is this thing called, the, in the mimicry literature, it's called this umbrella of protection, which essentially means how similar does mimic have to be to a model to receive some degree of protection. And you got to imagine. In the, open o in the ocean environment where a lot of these larvae are living, they're exposed to many different models simultaneously. And so there may be some optimal uh, kind of middle ground where they look a little bit about like a lot of different models. Or there could be situations where there's one model that's very abundant, and then all the fish that look like that model receive a lot of protection and others don't. And so it's, it's it really wide open for studying kind of simulations of this process, but we still have to get at what is the degree of protection that these organisms are getting. And, and we, we did do some simulations, and one of the things about larvae that I didn't mention before was that these populations are so massive that if there's only just a slight selection for some kind of trait, it can easily run away to fixation in that population. So uh, that's kind of another thing about these just the fact that they're so massive and there's, there can't, there's potential for such intense selection that you can get maybe it's essentially a little bit different than what these mimicry systems that we can see in the terrestrial world. Um, but I don't want to give the impression that I think all larvae are mimicking. I think it's a, an approach uh, that some larvae have. But there's a lot of complex interactions with uh, gelatinous organisms that we're starting to see with these um, imaging systems. And so, this is a, a type of gelatinous, or Skypomedusae, that's really common in the Mediterranean, but we were able to uh, measure it in the northern Gulf, where it's not quite as abundant, but it's, it's aggregating in deeper water. And so a lot of these net systems are not sampling it very well. Um, and so in two different years, we found that it was pretty abundant. This is from 2011, this is uh, 2016. And it performs this reverse diurnal vertical migration. So it's up during the daytime and down at, in the water column at night. 
And we were also able to quantify its association with um, fish larvae, or sorry, fish larvae and juveniles. So some were in the larval range, most were in the juvenile range. And you can see this is the, um, the y-axis is the oxygen concentration of an individual uh, Pelagia medusa. And uh, the size of the dot is the number of fish that are associated with that medusa. Um, and so you can see that in the daytime, the, the medusa are slightly in slightly higher oxygen water because they're up in the water column. And there tend to be a lot of fish associated with them. When we sample them at night, there are no fish associated with the medusa. And there tend to be also in these deeper, um, low oxygen waters. This is, of course, in the summer in the Gulf of Mexico in the, on the shelf. So there's a lot of hypoxia. So um, now that we've seen kind of these interactions, what are some paths forward? Uh, a lot of new questions coming with these imaging data. Um, and I think it fits in quite well with some of our approaches to understanding uh, zooplankton population dynamics. And so this is a recent paper that came out kind of overviewing this trait-based approach uh, to ocean, uh, ocean ecology, particularly plankton ecology. Um, a lot of the work I've done has been kind of at this individual level, looking at distributions of organisms, how they're interacting. Um, some of it's kind of fed into models. That's kind of what the spatial overlap index was designed to do. Um, but the trait-based approach really looks for these taxa transit, transcending functional traits. So the plankton system, extremely complicated if you dig down into details of taxonomy. Um, but we can understand how the system works by looking at these functional traits, like size, uh, feeding mode, which has been applied to uh, using copepod data, as well as uh, carbon content, you know, gelatinous versus non-gelatinous organisms. Um, and then uh, with the data, some of the data we're getting, we can actually visualize it in different ways. We can look at details of how species are distributed, or we can lump species together and look at how traits may be distributed. And that gets us to the ultimate goal, which is understanding how the system is functioning. And we can uh, you know, get at some of these rates. And so it's really a way that we can kind of merge some of these modeling approaches with some of the new data that we're getting. And it really fits well with some of the available tools. And it's, a lot of these tools we're making pretty big um, pretty, a lot, they're developing quite rapidly. So imaging, of course, is what I work with. Um, but a lot of the imaging, I think, would set up nicely to design laboratory experiments because we get a really good idea of the actual environment that many of these uh, larvae as well as gelatinous organisms are um, experiencing. And trait databases are really limited for anything outside of a copepod. There's a lot of good data on copepods just because they're much easier to sample quantitatively. Um, there's a lot of advances in the omics department. We can look at diets and things like that. Um, and then, uh, of course, modeling uh, to simulate these traits over time and make predictions to test empirically. And this, this approach has been used. This is a recent science paper where um, they used uh, essentially a, 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 a bucket of genomic traits and just run the model and s let natural selection take over and certain traits get discarded while others proliferate. And if you let the model run over a certain amount of time, it does simulate where they see certain microbial activity happening in the open ocean. And so this kind of approach, I think, is quite promising for zooplankton, but we really just don't know as much about how the traits of the zooplankton um, translate into which ones survive and which ones die. Whereas with microbes, it's very easy to say, well, but there's been a lot of work on the different uh, types of uh, transcriptomes and genomic functioning, and we know exactly what gene product or what, what protein product is produced by certain snippets of DNA. Uh, but we don't know as much about the zooplankton. And so this is just uh, some data from Lucho, who you guys all know, and uh, he's also working on the Concord data. So this is um, from the eastern corridor, the eastern side of the uh, sampling area during the summer months. Uh, the salinity in the background and the size of the uh, ring is showing the concentration. And so you can see these two groups. Uh, this is a predator of mostly copepods. This is a phytoplankton grazer. They have very different distributions. And so um, we have to consider the water mass history, the ecology of these different organisms, their diets. And uh, that's the thing that we're trying to get at. And I think we'll really, it's, it's a work in progress, but they're, what could be determining the distribution? It could be just the physiological limitations of the organism. It could be bottom up where it's their prey distribution. So uh, these guys are feeding a lot on marine snow and so marine snow tend to aggregate at this uh, picnic line. And so there might be 
that just might be where they uh, uh, survive the best. But it also could be top down. We get some idea of how much predation pressure there is with certain groups. Um, other groups that are larger, you need some um, sampling system that detects them. Um, but then there's also potential for parasites, indirect effects, these more complicated interactions. And so what determines distribution? It's probably a com it's obviously a combination of these things, but what's interesting is to try to get at under what circumstances certain certain mechanisms dominate. And so why when is it bottom up? When is it top down? And and uh, try to get at some of those questions. In image analysis, um, I like to say that the imaging data are very complex and there's not one just shock, there's not one approach that's going to give you everything that you need. And so um, right now, there's the convolutional neural network is the, uh, the way to go about it. So what we do is uh, segment the images and then use these neural networks to try to classify the different organisms um, and then randomly select a subset and compare a known uh, human ID versus the machine ID. And then you get something like this, which is a confusion matrix. So manual versus uh, computer. A good classifier will have really high numbers down the middle like this one does. This is done with low cam data. Um, on different uh, phytoplankton groups. Um, but there really isn't much work on how these uh, algorithms perform in these heterogeneous environments. So you saw the thin layer, you noticed how the environment changed so rapidly. What happens to the rates of, of accuracy uh, when these environments are very heterogeneous? And there's not a lot of work done on the resolution, the taxonomic resolution, so how much detail Ideally, you want to have the detail of taxonomy that the computer can perform best at, but a lot of groups try to push it to the limit as far as get the most detail, and sometimes that doesn't fit well with what the computer can do. So I think there's a lot of stuff that needs to be worked out as far as um, trying to get uh, really optimize these automated systems, and um, that's mostly why I've worked with uh, manual data sets so far, but uh, automated is definitely in the future. We just have to understand what it, what it gives us. So um, orientation is quite important, as we saw with mimicry. But a lot of these uh, training libraries, they to get a more robust uh, training data set, they rotate, they blur, they do a lot of these things to try to get essentially any orientation that you could possibly see in the environment. But I would argue that certain orientations are much more overrepresented in certain groups. And so uh, that's an important part of the ecology of some of these organisms and can help aid in uh, identification. The big problem with uh, uh, imaging in general, especially in coastal environments, is marine snow. It's really, really abundant. Um, it can be almost any size and shape. And so it introduces this kind of new hurdle that a lot of automated image processing algorithms don't even consider because it's, it's relatively unique for the coastal ocean, um, the abundance of these essentially noise that can pollute all your different categories. Um, very easy for us to tell apart, but not as easy for computers. And then again, of course, the, uh, the background is constantly changing, and so we need to understand how these algorithms perform in those areas. And so I really argue that um, software that we use has to be much more flexible. It's not going to be just a one, one way to analyze it. Um, and then we really need to also work on standardizing and organizing the image data in such a way that multiple groups can use it, because um, I feel like the stuff I've worked on has been mostly geared towards gelatinous organisms and fish larvae, but someone could easily look at it and uh, get some information about polychaetes and all these other different organisms that are in the uh, images themselves. I think we can take a page out of some other groups that have worked with large data sets. This is a, not an imaging data set, but it's, it's collected off the coast or around uh, the UK. And they have you know, a really nice network of users, and everyone kind of understands how to make the data available, how to make it. Um, so it's not just sitting in someone's lab after it's collected, so that other groups can use it in a way that's productive. And with that, I will thank all the Concord people, the animals we sampled and ones we didn't sample, and then uh, uh, Cedric Gigon, who's been a big help for a long time. He was one of the co-inventors of the ISIS and also uh, uh, has been a big help for a lot of the technical challenges of towing these imaging systems. So thank you. Questions? Yeah. So. <clears throat>
easily been convinced that the ISIS doesn't affect their behavior. But looking at those curled up flatfish, I wonder if that's a response to detecting an ISIS coming. Because the other presumed, the presumed benefit of being a flatfish is that you can be flat and then use that for uh, enhanced sinusoidal swimming, but also um, drifting. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make sense, again, now for them to curl. Mm -hmm. And so could that be, and with all that surface area, they, could, they may be the ones who can detect this coming the pressure wave. Does that um, make sense? Or? Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, there's Just not really a lot of evidence that other group, that, so in the paper, I talk about this specifically how it could be a response to the sampling system, or it could be a posture that they just occasionally do. I and mean, they're not all doing it. They're just a certain subset, I'd say, probably less than 30% that do it. Um, and I'm just estimating. But um, the other groups, yeah, it's just, yeah, I mean, they, they could be detecting it. It's going really fast. I mean, it's going up about five knots. There's some evidence that some of the larger ones are swimming away. And so there definitely is a certain size where they're a bit better at detecting it, and I think that's a, certainly a valid concern. Um, but the yeah, curl they're, they're not the only ones that curl up, though, because there's, there's a lot of leftist stuff with larvae that do it. I didn't really show any pictures of that. Yeah. But, um, Could a test of some of the mimicry be, you know, I, I read the papers, it's been a while, um, how your classification works? Like, so if you did it more automated, if things are supposed to be called Keating Nash and they'll be in Menhaden, that would be some sort of evidence. Uh, I mean, uh, objective kind of oh. evidence. Of well, that happens all the time. It's horrible if you compare, like, well, so what, the data. Well, I'm saying you could use that almost as data. <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying. In a way to support that argument. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is, I've compared some of the NERDA samples that we talked some about, the, some of the NERDA data, but. Um, when you, the flatfish, I think are almost always misclassified as salps or something because if you compare the automated to what, you know, I had students go through and find tons of flatfish and the automated is finding like none. Right. And so they're definitely getting dispersed into other groups. I've never looked at the details of where exactly they're going, but yeah, these automated algorithms just aren't very good for zooplankton especially. Like the confusion matrix I showed was from uh, the flow cam data. So that's on phytoplankton. They're relatively distinct as a color imager. So color is very important for classifying uh, images. And the fact that the, or the fact that the fish larvae are relatively rare, they orient in different ways. They somewhat mimic or resemble other groups. It makes it almost impossible to automatically pull them out. Other groups, you can, you're, you're fine because they're, they're abundant enough where the, there's mistakes here and there. You can quantify it. You get a pretty good idea of how many there are. It's not to the point where it's right. really quantitative. And a lot of the inverts are hard by so exoskeleton, so there's only so many. You just count them in different orientations, yeah. and they're not going to change shape or the fish. Sure. All right. <clears throat> OK, so uh, this is a very data-intensive collection procedure and extremely useful. I'm wondering if there are some particular challenges with sampling the imagery relative to features that are potentially very non-random. So you can't like just go through and take random slices of the of the data set to really find all the the uh, heterogeneity very effectively within the data stream that you're getting or whatever. So yeah. how do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, right now, I don't think anyone's dealing with it, which is a problem. Because I, I was trying to kind of trying to get at that in the talk. Maybe it wasn't totally clear, but yeah. So you go through these heterogeneous areas. The biomass is confined to a very narrow range. That narrow range is probably not segmented very well. So you're not isolating the regions of interest very well. Like in that thin layer, it's going to be one massive overlaying particle. We can see that there's there are things in there, like you can see a fish, you can see, you know, copepods and things like that. But when it's a net, a net of diatoms with little things that we can see, that the computer cannot pull apart 
those things within. And so it's going to it's going to undersample these biomass intense areas and then have yeah it's just it's not going to be an equal representation of where the biomass is so i i agree i mean there, the way way around it that i could think of just on top of my head was if you um sub have different algorithms say running on what is normal background and you can you can there's many ways you can quantify that you could look at the mean pixel value something like that of the entire image and if it's below a certain threshold you run your normal algorithm and then if it's above a certain threshold you flag it and you say all right this these data are going to go either to a human or some other kind of algorithm where there it's going to look at more of those details and so um yeah so i think the random sample doesn't help when it comes to that because you're going to miss some of these hot spots of activity which could be the most important thing you just don't know beforehand yeah sort of a tiered approach sounds like it might might be a way to yeah. Try to handle it. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. Yep. Adam, I'm interested in those, uh, the application of those machine learning algorithms, and it seems to me that oftentimes it's the, it's the sort of the diversity and the volume of the training set that can really help with that predictive power. Given the taxonomic diversity and the necessity of not being able to use color and it's a it's a shadow it's an image of a shadow mm -hmm. um how much of that is a limitation to to going to some sort of almost fully automated because i mean i think that was truly where you would like to go mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so is is that the primary hurdle or is it just the nature of the imaging that um just there's some there's just some limitations of that imaging platform and that's going to be the barrier i mean because if that's the case then you're kind of stuck there but mm -hmm. if it's a matter of just more eye more human eyes to generate a training set then it seems like there's a there's a optimistic path forward to yeah full realization of it really depends on the question so like if you're interested in relatively common plankton you can simplify the training set um, but and that could be adaptable to different systems but the problem is like with fish larvae especially they're relatively rare and so depending on the time of year you're out there you're going to see different types and so it's very hard to design a training set that's going to be good for say multiple systems or multiple seasons um, and yeah, it's just the the imaging certainly could be improved. I know there are systems out there that use color, which probably would help quite a bit. So a lot more information. Yeah, exactly. And so um, yeah, I the problem is when you go color, like you said, more information means the data volume goes up. And so these images are already we're collecting like two terabytes every four hours or something like that. Um, but there are ways, some systems will uh, almost pre-process the data, so cut out everything that's below a certain size you can't identify and then um, you know, go with that data. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, personally I think we're at the point, we're not at the point yet where we can just start throwing stuff out. And so I didn't really get into this, but with some of the automated systems, what they'll do is that in automated classification systems, they'll only take uh, segments that are above a certain probability threshold of being identified, and they'll throw everything out that's kind of uncertain, and then only look at high probability images, which in my mind is, is like calculate, like if you're a baseball fan, it's like calculating your batting average on fastballs right down the middle. It's like, it's not the same thing as like a real data set. And so I, yeah, it's just, I, I just think there has to be there's there's definitely work that has to be in the an automated sector, but there also has to be stuff of just evaluating what is the potential for these systems. What can we get and what can't we get? And yeah, it's gonna get more automated, but it's hard to know exactly what would be the best avenue towards improving it. But that's a good question. One more question? Yeah. So I thought the um, idea that maybe these like long strange times <coughs> are being used to help them free in some way. It's pretty interesting, and it seems really clear in these pictures uh, that 
it's possible, but my question, I guess, is I don't know much about fish. Like, is that how they see the world? I mean, like, whenever we're looking at their shadows, it's like, dang, they look really, really similar. Mm -hmm. And um, do they look that similar? Yeah, that's wild? a really, really good question. And that's, no that's sort of along the, the thing I was talking about, the, the umbrella of protection. It's all about how what the predator can perceive. And so there's a lot of literature about how mimicry is often imperfect, and there's a variety of reasons for that. It can be that there's just multiple models, and so that some in-between mimic is going to be most successful rather than resembling one very closely. Uh, but yeah, it all comes down to what the predator, how well they can perceive those differences. And uh, we just don't really know that right now. And so yes. I think there's a lot of potential to do some of these experiments. So that theory, you need to know more about the predator. It's not so much testing how much they look like, what they're trying to look like, as much as seeing yeah. what the Well, you have to know is. about what, yeah, which predators are out there and then what, how well they can tell apart. So you can imagine maybe a, a tank experiment where you make some jelly models and release some larvae. Like, it might be about movement also. Yeah. So the, the orient, that's where I was trying to get with the orientation. There, there could be some other cue that isn't just this you know, side by side pictures, but it's about how it moves or the uh, way it behaves. And so there, there is some evidence that these leptocephalus will, larvae will form these little balls and they'll look a lot like um, doliolids or salps and things like that. So they're, they're, yeah, there's a lot of unanswered questions. So it's just kind of like, you know, I think it's open to a lot of exploration. Seems like it. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. <laughs>